numbers of sharks, seemingly rising from out the dark waters beneath a hull, maliciously snapped at the blades of the oars, every time they dipped in the water, and in this way accompanied the boat with their bites. It is a thing not uncommonly happening to the whale boats in those swarming seas, the sharks at times apparently following them in the same Prussian way that vultures hover over the banners of marching regiments in the east. But these were the first sharks that had been observed by the Pequod since the white whale had been first described, and whether it was that Ahab's crew were all such tiger yellow barbarians, and therefore their flesh more musky to the senses of the sharks, a matter sometimes well known to affect them. However it was, they seemed to follow that one boat without molesting the others. Heart of wrought steel, murmured Starbuck gazing over the side, and following with his eyes the receding boat, canst thou yet ring boldly to that sight? Lowering thy keel among ravening sharks, and followed by them, open mouth to the chase, and this the critical third day? For when three days flow together in one continuous intense pursuit, be sure the first is the morning, the second the noon, and the third the evening and the end of that thing, be that end what it may. Oh! My God! What is this that shoots through me, and leaves me so deadly calm, yet expectant? Fixed at the top of a shudder, future things swim before me, as in empty outlines and skeletons, all the past is somehow grown dim. Mary, girl, thou faddest in pale glories behind me, boy, I seem to see but thy eyes grown wondrous blue, strangest problems of life seem clearing, but clouds sweep between, is my journey's end coming, my legs feel faint, like his who has footed it all day, feel thy heart, beats it yet, stir thyself, Starbuck, stave it off, move, move, Speak aloud. Mast head there. See ye my boy's hand on the hill? Praise. Aloft there. Keep thy keenest eye upon the boats colon dash dash. Mark well the whale. Ho. Again. Drive off that hawk. See. He pecks. He tears the vein, pointing to the red flag flying at the main dash truck dash dash. Ha. He soars away with it. Where's the old man now? See street thou that sight, O oh, Herb. Shudder, shudder. The boats had not gone very far, when by a signal from the mast dash heads dash dash a downward pointed arm, Ahab knew that the whale had sounded, but intending to be near him at the next rising, he held on his way a little sideways from the vessel, the becharmed crew maintaining the profoundest silence, as the head beat waves hammered and hammered against the opposing bow. Drive, drive in your nails. O oh, ye waves, to their uttermost heads drive them in. Ye but strike a thing without a lid, and no coffin and no hearse can be, mine colon dash dash and hemp only can kill me. Ha! Ha! Suddenly the waters around them slowly swelled in broad circles, then quickly upheaved, as if sideways sliding from a submerged berg of ice, swiftly rising to the surface. A low rumbling sound was heard a subterraneous hum, and then all held their breaths, as bedraggled with trailing ropes, and harpoons, and lances, a vast form shot lengthwise, but obliquely from the sea. Shrouded in a thin drooping veil of mist, it hovered for a moment in the rainbowed air, and then fell swamping back into the deep. Crushed thirty feet upwards, the waters flashed for an instant like heaps of fountains then brokenly sank in a shower of flakes, leaving the circling surface creamed like new milk round the marble trunk of the whale. Give way! cried Ahab to the oarsmen, and the boats darted forward to the attack, but maddened by yesterday's fresh irons that corroded in him, Moby Dick seemed combinedly possessed by all the angels that fell from heaven. The wide tears of welded tendons overspreading his broad white forehead, beneath the transparent skin, looked knitted together, as head on, he came churning his tail among the boats, and once more flailed them apart, spilling out the irons and lances from the two mates' boats, and dashing in one side of the upper part of their bows, but leaving the Habs almost without a scar. 
while Dagu and Queekai were stopping the strained planks, and as the whale swimming out from them, turned, and showed one entire flank as he shot by them again, at that moment a quick cry went up, flashed round and round to the fish's back, pinioned in the turns upon turns in which, during the past night, the whale had reeled the involutions of the lines around him. The half-torn body of the Parsi was seen, his sable raiment frayed to shreds, his distended eyes turned full upon old Ahab. The harpoon dropped from his hand. Be fooled, be fooled. Drawing in a long lean breath, I, I Parsi, I see thee again, dot dash dash I, and thou goest before, and this, this then is the hearse that thou didst promise. But I hold thee to the last letter of thy word. Where is the second hearse? Away, mates, to the ship. Those boats are useless now. Repair them if ye can in time, and return to me. If not, a have is enough to die, down, men. The first thing that but offers to jump from this boat I stand in, that thing I harpoon. Ye are not other men, but my arms and my legs. And so obey me, dot dash dash where's the whale? Gone down again? But he looked too nigh the boat, for as if bent upon escaping with the corpse he bore, and as if the particular place of the last encounter had been but a stage in his leeward voyage, Moby Dick was now again steadily swimming forward, and had almost passed the ship, which thus far had been sailing in the contrary direction to him, though for the present her headway had been stopped. He seemed swimming with his utmost velocity, and now only intent upon pursuing his own straight path in the sea. Oh, Ahab, cried Starbuck, not too late is it, even now, the third day, to desist. See, Moby Dick seeks thee not, it is thou, thou, that madly seekest him. Setting sail to the rising wind, the lonely boat was swiftly impelled to the leeward, by both oars and canvas. And at last when Ahab was sliding by the vessel, so near as plainly to distinguish Starbuck's face as he leaned over the rail, he hailed him to turn the vessel about, and follow him, not too swiftly, at a judicious interval. Glancing upwards, he saw Tashtigo, Quikug, and Daggu, eagerly mounting to the three mastheads, while the oarsmen were rocking in the two stave boats which had but just been hoisted to the side, and were busily at work in repairing them, one after the other, through the portholes, as he sped, he also caught flying glimpses of stub and flask, busying themselves on deck among bundles of new irons and lances, as he saw all this, as he heard the hammers in the broken boats, far other hammers seemed driving a nail into his heart. But he rallied, and now marking that the vane or flag was gone from the main mast head, he shouted to Tashtigo, who had just gained that perch, to descend again for another flag, and a hammer and nails, and so nailed to the mast. Whether fagged by the three days running chase, and the resistance to his swimming in the knotted hamper he bore, or whether it was some latent deceitfulness and malice in him, whichever was true, the white whale's way now began to abate, as it seemed, from the boat so rapidly nearing him once more, though indeed the whale's last start had not been so long a one as before, and still as a hap glided over the waves the unpitying sharks accompanied him, and so pertinaciously stuck to the boat, and so continually bit at the plying oars, that the blades became jagged and crunched, and left small splinters in the sea, at almost every dip. Heed them not, those teeth but give new rowlocks to your oars. Pull on, tis the better rest, the shark's jaw than the yielding water. But at every bite, sir, the thin blades grow smaller and smaller. They will last long enough. Pull on. But who can tell, he muttered, whether these sharks swim to feast on the whale or on a hab? But pull on. I, all alive, now, we near him. The helm. Take the helm. Let me pass. And so saying two of the oarsmen helped him forward to the bowels of the still-flying boat. At length as the craft was cast to one side, 
and ran ranging along with the white whale's flank, he seemed strangely oblivious of its advance, as the whale sometimes will, and the hab was fairly within the smoky mountain mist, which, thrown off from the whale's spout, curled round his great, monad not hump, he was even thus close to him, when, with body arched back, and both arms lengthwise high lifted to the poise, he darted his fierce iron, and his far fiercer curse into the hated whale, as both steel and curse sank to the socket, as if sucked into a morass, Moby Dick sideways writhed, spasmodically rolled his nigh, 